thoughts on electricity and heat decarbonisation, and these are just these are just stray thoughts. Uh, uh, the intention is to get a conversation going. So first of all, let's look at the interplay of demand and supply. Uh, if we're going to decarbonise the United Kingdom uh, economy, do we emphasise the demand side of the economy or do we do it all upstream? That's uh, a really interesting question. What I've sketched here is the possible shape of marginal costs uh, of energy supplied or saved on the demand side in black and on the supply side of the economy in red. And this is in principle only, because this is still playing out. Um, this, the, uh, the, the reality is, is highly dynamic. But I think they cross somewhere. And at that point, that's the point that we as a society, policymakers, uh, 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 should aim for, to aim to try to hit. The problem is that that point, that crossover, is not well defined. So maybe, in particular, the red curve goes down as you deploy more and more supply, decarbonised supply, rather than up. Yes, your wind turbines get further away from the shore, but you get better and better at doing wind turbines and they get bigger and bigger. We don't know uh, which direction that's going to go in. Uh, maybe if the wind turbines go, don't get cheaper, maybe the PV does. I think there's a real prospect now of PV at a penny a kilowatt hour at some point. Almost too cheap to meter, to use an old phrase that some of you may remember from a previous millennium. So <coughs> energy demand will only get us so far. Uh, at some point there is a, uh, a residual level of heat that you cannot just efficiency away uh, and you have to supply it. There are dense webs of socio-technical constraints in buildings, in particular in dwellings. Every existing dwelling is a prototype. We used to mock ourselves gently as a country because we had five different prototype nuclear power stations on the go uh, in the 1970s. Well, uh, you ain't seen nothing until you've seen the built environment. Uh, and there is comparative simplicity on the supply side. Um, so, moving on. Um, trends of the last 10 years. We have decarbonized electricity, but we haven't decarbonized gas. We are essentially, to a first approximation, in the built environment, a two-fuel economy. Yes, I know there are twice as many people living off, off the gas grid in the United Kingdom as there are in the whole of Denmark, but it's still quite small beer in this country in the context of the United Kingdom. Uh, this was almost all done by large-scale technology. Uh, distributed generation has proven, as many of us predicted for, for some time, to be a, a sideshow. Rooftop PV is currently about 25% of total PV installed, uh, and PV is running second at the moment to wind, all of which, effectively, uh, apart from the ones that were installed on uh, uh, Mr. Cameron's uh, roof, uh, before the election, before the election, before last, um, uh, are, are large scale, effectively. This is what I said um, uh, in 2007. Uh, I, I, I stated that decarbonisation of grid electricity was going to be key to decarbonising UK housing, and I predicted that the carbon intensity of grid electricity, then around 550 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, would halve by 2050. Um, I, 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 uh, my precise words were given the lead time of more than four decades in the face of so many different opportunities for doing it, um, et cetera, et cetera, I'd be surprised if it didn't happen. Well, <clears throat> we did it by about 2018, uh, three decades and a bit ahead of schedule. Uh, that is an amazing achievement, uh, and I see no reason uh, why uh, it's going to stop. Uh, why were we so successful? Uh, first of all, it was merely the next phase of, of an historical trend that goes back as far as the published data and further. So uh, if you go back to the early 1900s, uh, 
electricity was phenomenally carbon intensive and it has got better and better by leaps and bounds. There was a willingness on the part of policymakers in the UK and across the EU, in particular in places like Denmark and Germany, to back emerge, emerging technologies and in particular wind power. Uh, and this, this uh, held over a period of at least 70 years. And I will show you some pictures to illustrate that in a moment. And then the third uh, reason we were so successful is that electricity grids lend themselves to plug and play. They are engineered to accommodate a diversity of generation technologies while shielding the rest of us from all of that unpleasant complexity, that upstream complexity. Uh, and the gas grid doesn't really work that way. Uh, I said I'd show you some pictures just to illustrate the 70 years claim. This is a photograph I took in about 1979 uh, in uh, Shelland uh, in South uh, East Denmark of uh, the Gedzer turbine. And I know there's at least one person here who recognizes the picture, uh, Derek. Um, uh, and, and this wasn't even the beginning of the story. Uh, this was merely the post-war phase uh, of Danish wind power uh, development. They'd got used to the idea by about 1950 that every few decades their southern neighbour would invade them and there would be complete chaos for about five or six years uh, and they would have to uh, uh, make do and mend uh, and they needed domestic energy supplies. And this is where we are now. Uh, this is... Uh, the enormous uh, wind farm uh, off the coast of Cumbria, uh, which I believe is the largest uh, in the world. How far will this go, this process of decarbonizing the electricity system? I think it will go all the way. I think uh, we now uh, have the means in our hands to decarbonize electricity completely. Um, and uh, economies of scale... Um, unstoppable learning curves and so on. And I want to just uh, finish by saying uh, that so far, the stress in the system that that causes has been managed so far. Uh, yes, there was a hiccup in August um, of last year, but, uh, but the but, uh, National Grid uh, prevented the whole system from going down and we only lost part of the country and we recovered fairly quickly. To the extent that there were major inconveniences, it was because we didn't know how to reboot the trains remotely. And that isn't really a grid problem, although it was revealed by a grid problem. 